This is Lothar Tuppen, creator of The Sword of the Crimson Tatters, and you're listening to the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. The Leviathan Chronicles Season 3 The story thus far. An unthinkable plot has been revealed. The former Black Door team of Jason Sterling and Whit Roberts, along with the Seraxian aliens, have reached the Crossbow Station on Devon Island in the Canadian High North. The station was built by Nankatsu Industries using alien technology for the express purpose of launching a satellite location beacon into a high orbit above the Earth When the satellite reaches position, it will transmit a signal bringing the Seraxian fleet to Earth to initiate a full-scale invasion of the planet and begin converting mankind into monstrous, mutated enforcers. Sterling and Roberts have negotiated with the Seraxians to establish a permanent breeding colony to guarantee a continuing supply of modified soldiers, as well as ensure the ongoing survival of the human species. As part of their agreement, Sterling and Roberts would be appointed as the absolute monarchs of this last human colony. Back in Leviathan, a senior council member has been murdered. After downloading his consciousness into a mammoth-class loading mech, the malevolent AI known as Maddox brutalized engineering chief Marcus Denson, ripping his body in half, and is now looking for an exit out of Leviathan. And lastly, Evangeline has ordered McAllen, Tully, Oberlin, and Anton to board the Condor and race north to Nunavut to intercept the Black Door group before they can initiate the Seraxian plans to convert Earth's human population into a warrior slave race. And now, Chapter 48, Crossbow. The scramjet's boosters kicked in violently at 95,000 feet above the western coast of British Columbia, causing the external surface of the condor to rise to over 700 degrees Fahrenheit. The horizon was equally divided between the flashing blue of the Pacific Ocean and the noctilucent clouds high above it. With the pitch blackness of space seeming to loom dangerously just above the cockpit window, Anton leaned closely over one of the touchscreen monitors, showing a topographical representation of Devon Island. He punched several keys along the navigation cluster to make a small course correction to prevent the possibility of visual detection. He barely heard Captain Geoffrey Tully enter the cockpit of the Condor and sit down in the co-pilot's chair next to him. My god, it's a hell of a view up here. That it is. So... How high can this bird fly? High. Yeah, but how high? The Condor's not a spaceship, Mr. Tully. Just Tully is fine. But if you say she's not a spaceship, then theoretically, how high could... Well, she's almost a spaceship. Tully peered off to the side window, where the curvature of the Earth was now clearly visible through the cockpit. The landmass of the North American continent seemed washed out compared to the radiant streak of bright silver that curved gently above the stratosphere. That's the atmosphere, isn't it? Like the actual atmosphere? The lower part of it, yes. It all seems a bit small up here, doesn't it? The Earth. The Earth, yeah, but but all the countries. So small, so much fighting over so... so little. Over what? <sighs> Tell me something, Tully. Yeah? What do you know about this crossbow station? Just what I was able to get out of Kasanori Tanaka. Built by Nankatsu Industries, constructed to the standards of the Black Door Group. Remote, cold. And it's a place that's very, very important to the aliens. What about armament, defensive capabilities? I don't know. Probably a lot. This place serves a purpose, and Black Door is ready to defend it. Below, glacial cover and snow became more prevalent over the Yukon Territory. As the Condor continued northeast, the browns and dark greens soon gave way to wide swaths of brilliant reflective white. I hate this. What's that? This. Flying blind into... Into an ambush. What are you worried about? Doesn't the Condor have some sort of camouflage? A photocloak. Right. A photocloak system. That'll work, right? They'll never see us coming. Tully, 
What kind of technology was used in the construction of the crossbow station? I don't know. Alien technology? Yeah, and what kind of technology do you think we adapted for the construction of the condor? Oh, probably alien technology. Probably. Do you see my concern? Now that you put it that way, yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Tully fell quiet and tried to distract himself by becoming mesmerized by the suborbital view. He arrived at the conclusion that were he not to return from this mission alive, his life had been definitively enhanced by the opportunity to see the Earth just once from such a vantage point. Hey, Anton. Yes, Tully. I just wanted to say that, um, that I really appreciate all your help back in Tokyo. Without Oberlin, I, well, I don't really have that much family anymore, and it was really good to have your help. So what I guess, what I'm trying to say is, um, I'm really sorry that I put you in coach. Thank you, Tully. That's very gracious of you. I'm sorry that your boat was blown up back in Alaska. Yeah, um, that, that seems worse. Well, when you're done enjoying the view, do you want to check if those two in the after are okay? You can tell them we're about 40 minutes from touchdown. Will do. Back in the rear cabin of the Condor, McAllen and Oberlin were organizing the cold weather gear and laying out the implements of their assault. Hey, Oberlin, yeah? help me take a look at what Astrid packed for us. Can you flip the latch on the crate there? Sure. Nice. Wow, Astrid wasn't screwing around. Inside the crate lay four light gray ceramic short nose automatic rifles ensconced in foam housings. God, I love Astrid. Next to each were attachments for laser targeting and high res digital rangefinders. Okay, let's get these assembled and loaded. Oberlin, can you grab those shoulder holsters and attach them to the exposure suits? Sure thing. When we're done with these, we should check the detonation device. Uh, detonation device? Yeah, the bomb. Astrid gave us a bunker buster big enough to turn this island into a frozen lagoon. Huh. I wouldn't expect anything less from you, McAllen. Oh, stop. <laughs> I was just kidding. No, seriously. Stop for a second. Oberlin put down the heavy white parka he was holding and peered at McAllen with a slightly confused look on his face. Oberlin, do you ever wish I never stepped foot on your boat? I mean, I feel like... Since the moment you and Tully laid eyes on me, I've been nothing but trouble for you both, especially you. I'm sorry for all the pain I cause and this danger I put us in. You're a good man, Oberlin. You must think that you'd be a lot better off had I just kept driving past Homer and found another boat to help me chase the Cedar Elm. Oberlin looked down at his hand, now in possession of only four fingers, and then back at McAllen. I don't think that for a single second, McAllen. I know you, I know that we, are fighting for something much bigger than anything Tully and I were scraping the bottom of the ocean to try to find. The stakes are much higher than just paying our fuel tab every month at the marina. I know you didn't ask for any of this either, but you still showed up, McAllen, and you decided to risk your life and help people you barely knew because it was the right thing to do. The brave thing. That takes a lot of courage, McAllen. The kind that most people can't be bothered to find within themselves. Life these days just takes too much from you. And for two guys that were up to their necks in debt and riding the world's most perfect losing streak, we've now been given the opportunity to make a difference in the course of history. You know, sometimes when you're broke, the world has a way of making you feel like you don't matter. And pretty soon, it becomes easy to start thinking that about yourself. So whatever the cost might have been, you helped remind me that I do matter and that we all can make a difference in the world, large or small. And I would gladly have traded a finger to be one of the ones that helped save it. Wow. Do you really believe that, Oberlin? <laughs> no. But the Yakuza would have killed us by now anyway, so... I guess I'm pretty happy that you came on board my boat, McAllen. Oh. <sighs> you sure know how to make a girl feel special, Oberlin St. Clair. <laughs> I try. Hey, but seriously, are you ready for this? If everything we've learned about Nankatsu and these aliens is true, then it sounds like we really don't have much choice. Thirty minutes later, the condor sliced through the thin air above the Arctic Circle as Anton made the calculations for initial approach. 
The smooth sky below the stratosphere soon gave way to sudden air pockets and icy wind shears coming off the Haddington mountain range. Hey, Anton told me to tell you that we're starting final approach. Got it. Thanks, Tully. Hey, McAllen, are you ready for this? Yeah. Are you ready for this, Tully? Yeah, I am. Jeez. The floor of the Condor tilted slightly as the ship banked gently to the right. It meant they were getting close. McAllen and Oberlin turned their attention back to the assault gear. Here, I think the attachment goes Yeah, to well, uh... Um, okay. I'm going to I'm just gonna head back into the cockpit Perfect. and see if Anton needs any help. You guys just, um... Yeah, I think I saw them over yeah, here. you look like you got this. Tully turned around dejectedly and walked back towards the nose of the Condor. Anton barely acknowledged Tully's return. Do you see anything yet? I thought we were getting pretty close. You probably don't see anything yet. Hey, do you need any... Activating infrared. Wait, what? The center of the cockpit window shimmered and was soon replaced with an augmented reality heat map of Devon Island below. There. In the far left corner of the window, a small streak of orange rapidly grew in strength. I see it. That has to be crossbow, right? Devon Island is uninhabited, and that's a lot of heat at this distance. As the condor dropped below cloud base, the mountainous contours of the island's ice cap came into view. The long drifts of snow seemed oceanic in their repetitive shape and sharp reflection of the low sun. The condor steepened its descent towards a narrow valley that stretched all the way to the shores of the Davis Strait, not far from the base of a small rock outcropping in the distance. Tully made out two half-cylindrical buildings connected by a silverish rectangular structure in the middle. A dark grey trench stretched out to a metallic circle in the ground over two miles away. Multiple antennas and radar arrays were positioned on the roof, and a retaining wall with several layers of steel fencing were visible. Show EM filter. Fuck, electric fencing over 50,000 volts. High amperage could kill a herd of elephants. You think they can see us at this distance with the photo cloak on? Something's not right. What do you- Anton ignored Tully and swiveled his chair to stare more urgently at the monitors in the center of the cockpit. The air, the landscape, even the condor itself seemed eerily still. What? What do you mean? Do you see McCallan, something that- Oberlin, strap in and prepare for evasive maneuvers. Wait, what evasive maneuvers? What are you seeing? Nothing. I'm seeing nothing. That's the problem, Mr. Tully. Look, I told you that just Tully- Activating glide mode. Tully, shut down all engines and scramjet afterburners. Everything except the avionics. I'm on it, but why are we- Just do it! All right, all right. Just as Tully finished toggling the switches, two tiny specks of searing light emerged from the distant crossbow station. I'm showing two missiles, no ID, heading for us at high speed. Let's see how smart they are. They can't get a lock on the Condor if we have no heat signature, right? That's the idea, Tully. They're heading right for us. That they are. 100 clicks and closing. Let's see how smart they are. 75 clicks. Anton stared unmovingly at the angry flames of light. 50 clicks. Without moving his head, he made a subtle correction, pulling the flight stick gently to the left. His heart dropped as the missiles subtly adjusted their trajectory as well. Tully, give me full engine power. Spool the afterburners to full strength. Do it now. Stop. Engines A and B, online. Engine C, still warming. Afterburners are priming. Give me distance. 25 kilometers in closing. Hold on tight. Anton pulled back violently on the flight stick, <laughs> sending the condor screaming towards the upper reaches of the atmosphere. Anton! Tully felt himself pinned against his chair, and his vision began to narrow as much of his blood left his head. He held on to a fuzzy image of the two missiles, now wobbling and unsteady. Engine C. Yeah. Another surge pounded into the backs of Anton and Telly. Both of them watched the two missiles race past the underside of the condor. They missed! Anton, the missiles, they, they... They missed, but they're still locked onto us. They're coming around for another pass. Hold on tight! The condor approached a near vertical flight stance as the ship climbed higher and higher. Anton! Tully felt his consciousness slipping away from him as he watched the altimeter race past a hundred thousand feet. Look! The monitor! In the rear camera monitor, Tully could see the two missiles now falling away like tumbling matchsticks, growing small as they fell from the sky end over end. Anton quickly leveled out the condor and began its descent back down to Earth. Tully! Tully, are you alright? Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Um, is there a, a barf bag or something that I Stay could- Stay sharp! We lost those two missiles, but they're not going to be the last. Tully, what's our position? We're about 120 miles off course, entering Danish airspace over Greenland. Got it. Taking us 90 degrees port on a southern heading that should take us back- Whoa! Missile warning! Three, 
No, four, Sam's. 90 kilometers, closing fast. Shit, is Photocloak active? It is. Then why are they closing? It's a damn good question. Hold tight, we can outrun them. Evasive maneuvers. Still closing. Damn it. Two missiles from Vector 175, two more on headings 260. I see them. Multiple vectors mean that they must have missile batteries hidden all over the island. I thought you said this island was uninhabited. The Condor dipped sharply and was racing back towards Devon Island, building speed while the four deadly Stinger missiles tore across the Arctic sky on a perpendicular course. Let's get some distance between us and those missiles. Give me full afterburners. I hold tight. Anton pulled the flight stick hard to the right, launching the Condor into a steep bank. Anton, I hate to ask this, but what's faster? The Condor? I guess or... we'll have to find out, Mr. Tully. We've got to get lower. What? We've got to get lower to get a clean shot at those missile batteries. With what? The Condor is a stealth craft. We don't have any armaments, Tully. Shit! Then we, then we should still get lower. Maybe we can lose them in the Haddington Mountains if we... I'm trying, Tully! The ground was now approaching faster and wider across the cockpit window, filling it with the gleaming white of the island's high glacier. 10,000 feet. Anton strained to pull back on the flight stick, oh. leveling the condor at less than 7,000 feet. He rolled and banked the plane between two sprawling mountain peaks. Oh. The missiles! They must have hit the mountains. Tully, check the rear camera monitors. No sign of the stingers. We did it. We did it, Anton. <sighs> Run a LiDAR scan, Tully. Check for any other incoming. I'll work on getting us back on course. Hey, nice flying, Anton. Thanks. Although I think your praise is unwarranted. What do you mean? The missiles. They detonated too early. They weren't even close. I guess the photo clock fooled them. Maybe. I still don't think <laughs> The fourth missile violently struck the Condor's left wing and quickly disintegrated it. We're here! We're here! System-wide failures! The I Condor corkscrewed violently through the pale Arctic sky as flames and black pressure. smoke Come poured on. out of the left side of the plane. Shit, air time! Awesome. Shut down! Main engines! Shut everything down! Hover van! Tully! Bottom reach! Hover van! Tully's hand seesawed in front of him. He desperately tried to make his fingers reach the hover fan switch that was just inches away. I can't reach it. 2,000 feet. Almost. Hurry. Come on, I, Tully. I, I, Tully. I got it. I got it. On the underside of the condor, the two remaining hover fans roared to life. Anton pushed full power to arrest the deathly spiral that the ship was trapped in. I've got attitude control, but we're still falling too far. Anton, we've got to pull up. I'm trying, Tully. 1,000 feet. Switch to manual control. Pull up the emergency flaps. Flaps up. The powerful hover fans finally arrested the Condor's descending spiral, but the ship was still falling fast. Anton did his best to preserve the forward momentum of the ship's glide mode as the Condor shot out of the Haddington mountain range over the open tundra below. Great. Come on, you son of a bitch. McCallan, Oberlin, brace for impact. I repeat, brace for impact. Anton, look, there. Several miles ahead, a metallic flash caught Anton's eye. I see it. We're never going to make it. Never say never, Tully. The Condor now resembled an ashen comet racing across the sky. Anton did his best to angle the ship's belly to be perpendicular to the ground. Gonna crash! I don't crash, Tully. What the hell do you call slamming into the frozen ice with a plane missing one out of two wings? A hard landing. Now get ready! McCallum! Oberlin! Did you guys hear Anton? We're gonna crit on um, a very, very hard landing. Brace yourselves really well. At the end of the valley, nestled in the base of the Grey Eastern Mountain Range, was the crossbow station. The Condor was heading directly for it. Here we go. Hold on tight. The Condor slammed into the frozen ground of Devon Island. The blades of the hover fans instantly cracked and twisted against the violent impact. Every monitor in the flight deck shattered and splintered, spraying shards and crystals into Anton and Tully. The main fuselage of the plane slid along the snow and ice for another mile and a half. A jagged piece of the lower fuselage shot painfully into the floor of the cockpit, crushing Tully's right foot. Hang on! Anton, look out! 
The crossbow station rapidly grew closer to the ship as it slid across the ice. Two separate layers of 30-foot-high electrified chain-link fence surrounded the U-shaped structure. The condor listed sideways as its massive slide continued. What was left of the ship's left wing dug into the ground, causing the condor to flip and roll end over end, out of control, sliding until... The condor decimated the southern expanse of fencing, crushing it into the ground as it slid over, leaving the plane to come to a rest within the inner perimeter of the crossbow station. Anton, wake up! Can you hear me? Please, man. Anton, Anton! Tully, Tully, but my butt, I can't! Anton, Tully! McAllen, McAllen, are you okay? Anton, we gotta see if McCallan and Oberlin are okay. Anton struggled to force his limbs to obey. I'm okay. I'm okay, Tully. He took a cautious step before wearily slumping to the floor. Anton took another deep breath and stood up in what was left of the cockpit. Tully, uh, I got you. Put your arm over my shoulder. Hi, Anton. Anton, you're still bleeding, man. It's nothing. Come on, we need to get this door open. Can you reach it with your other hand? Shit, it's jammed. Here, hold on to this one. Anton! Tully! Hang on, McAllen! Tully, we need to help Oberlin. You guys gotta open the door! It's jammed! We're trying! Come on, Anton. I'll hold the latch down, you kick. You ready? Tully, hurry! Watch out, McAllen! We're gonna try to break the door down. Get back! Oh my god, Anton, are you alright? Your face! I'm not too bad. I'm sorry about the landing. I did the best I could. Are you okay, McAllen? I'm a, I'm... I'm okay. A little shaken, but I'm... I'm fine. Tully? My foot got jammed pretty hard. I think it might be broke. Where's Oberlin? Ah! Please, get it off! One of the crates is pinned against his arm. I can't feel my hand! Get it off! Come on, we have to help him. Ah! Hang in there. Ah! Here, I, I got you, Oberlin. Ah! We're gonna get this off you. You ready? Come on, let's move this on three. Ready? One, two... Ah! Look out! We've got to return to fire. Where are the rifles? Right on top of my damn arm! from launching. Fuck! It's that asshole, Witch Roberts! This is where you immortals die! Everyone get back! Take cover! McCallum pushed everyone to the back as an anti-tank grenade landed 20 feet from where they took cover. <laughs> 10 minutes earlier, within the crossbow station, Four anti-cloak missiles away. Distance to target. 90 kilometers and closing. That should finish them off. They're too low to get to altitude again. Good job luring them in. The first two missiles were conventional, but with the modifications the aliens gave us, the Condor won't stand a chance. Are the preparations for launch complete? I'm reading all systems nominative. Once we give the ignition command, it will take two minutes for photocloak to be initialized, and then the arrow will be invisible to all NATO and Russian surveillance and countermeasures. Good. Begin the launch countdown and fire the arrow. Let a new dawn in human history. Jason, I have four missile detonations. The Condor? I, I can't get a clean read. It looks like it was hit. Wit, look. Jason Sterling and Whit Roberts stared out of the massive glass windows to see the Condor streaking like a burning comet falling out of the sky. It was heading directly for the crossbow station. Launch the arrow, Wit. For God's sake, launch the arrow! Photocloak is still stabilizing. We need 60 more seconds. Damn the photocloak. Activate ignition and launch the damn missile. We can't, Jason. Without photocloak, the arrow will be shot down before it ever leaves the atmosphere. Then fire the anti-aircraft missiles. Fire everything we have. They're too close to get a lock. They're too close to... Jason, they've broken through the perimeter. They're through... Wait, wait, what's the launch status? Can we fire the arrow? Photocloak is stable, but the Condor has severed the decoupling cable. We can't release the locking braces from here in the station. Then get out to the launch pad. Jason, they've made it to the inner perimeter. Then get to hell down there and kill every last one of them. With pleasure. Back on the Condor. Grenade! Get down, get down! No! No, 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 no! You have 
for my strength, McCallan. McCallan's eyes narrowed. Take care of them all. Time slowed as all of her concentration focused on the explosive sphere, making sure it connected with her hand. She instantaneously threw the grenade high in the air, back toward the crossbow station. The grenade detonated above the entrance, sending giant chunks of metal and stone downward. The collapsed entrance now blocked any clean shot Whit Roberts might have had on the group. Holy shit, McCallan, are you crazy? Okay, we've blocked his line of sight. Anton, help me get this crate off Oberlin. On it. We're here, Oberlin. We're going to help you. <laughs> How's your hand? Pins and needles, but I don't think anything is broken. Let me see. Think you can hold a gun? It's a frog's arse, watertight. <laughs> Anton, how's your head? Better than Oberlin's arm. Tully stood up, but took one step on his injured foot and quickly fell to the ground. Tully! I can do this, I can- Tully, sit down on this crate. No, no, I'm fine. I just need a second. Tully! Shut up, Oberlin, I can do this. I just need to get a, get me a brace or something so I- Tully. Back off, Anton. Not now, not fucking now. I'm going with you guys. We're a team, right? We are a team. You've been hurt helping this team. Right now, having you out there will make it more dangerous for everyone. For Oberlin and for McCallan. We still need your help. You'll need to stay here. What the hell are you talking about? Take this. It's a low-frequency transmitter to Henderson Riverstone. We just lost our ride, and with the Condor in pieces, this might be the only way we can get home. So I need you. We all need you to stay here. Keep it safe and activate it when the time comes. How am I supposed to know when that is? You'll know, Tully. Please. For McCallan. Okay, I'll stay here. I'll just, uh... Tully, listen, I know this sucks, but I need you here. We've got to think about the mission. I am. I'm with you, McCallum. Good. Okay, let's get our exposure suits on. Anton, grab the rifles. Oberlin, you're behind me. Tully, you're here loaded for bear in case Black Door tries to get in and take the transponder beacon. You've got three rifles and a crate full of plasma explosives next to you. You've got to stay sharp and defend what's left of the Condor. The beacon might be our only way out. I got it. And hey, McCallan. What? You make those sons of bitches pay. They're gonna pay, Tully. Guys, eyes up. Let's move in. The three of them dashed out of the remains of the Condor. The team ran toward the right side of the crossbow station that contained the vehicular garage. The ceiling here is collapsed. The snow and ice boulders have most of the entrance sealed. There! I think there's an opening towards the left side. It's tight, but I think we can squeeze through if we... Get down! Get down! Through the opening in the collapsed roof, Oberlin could see Whit Roberts reloading his MP5K submachine gun. Leave them, Whit. I'll take care of them. Get to the arrow, Whit. Whit locked eyes with Oberlin and scowled before sprinting to the vehicle depot. As McAllen and her team pushed through the small opening, they could see Whit jumping on a snowmobile and heading east at high speed. Whit Roberts. I'm going after Roberts. Oberlin. You don't understand. The man is a psychopath. I've got a score to settle. No! Oberlin, you're on! But it was too late. Oberlin sprinted out of earshot and had already reached the garage of snowcats, bulldozers, and snowmobiles. He jumped on a Ski-Doo 800, pushed the ignition button, and roared after Whit. You're not going to win this time, Wit. I'm going to destroy that smug face of yours and make you pay for what you did to me. This is me, hunting you now. Oberlin raced out of the crossbow station onto the frozen tundra. The unforgiving iciness of the Arctic winds caused his eyes to water and freeze simultaneously. He wiped his eyes painfully with his snow-covered mitten and struggled to see Wit ahead of him. Where are you, Wit? Oberlin tilted his head downwards to focus on the snowmobile tracks in front of him. The straight tracks he was following soon started to veer erratically side to side. He knows I'm following him. He knows. He's trying to shake. He must have heard when I... Oh! Whit Roberts smashed his snowmobile into the front of Oberlin's ski doo crushing his right ski and jerking Oberlin's head and neck violently. The strut of Oberlin's ski doo was now enmeshed into the front housing of Whit's snowmobile. Whit pulled back his fist and shot it across Oberlin's jaw with enough force to knock Oberlin backwards, bringing his face dangerously close to the spinning treads of the snowmobile. Oberlin's face was barely centimeters away from the track drive and spinning gears, when suddenly the conjoined snowmobiles roared over an unseen bird, sending the men and sleds over six feet through the air. The machines crashed violently into the hard ground as the two snowmobiles separated again. 
Oberlin angrily yanked the handlebars to the right to collide back into width. Oberlin's maneuverability was limited, and the impact was minor. Removing his glove, he pulled back and unloaded his fist across the sled, connecting his knuckles with Witt's cheekbone and feeling something hard fracture under his blow. Oberlin knew he couldn't keep up the fight for long. I'm not done fixing your face, Roberts! Whit retaliated and landed a heavy shot just below Oberlin's left arm. He knew his gloved hand had little effect, so he lowered his aim and dealt a crushing jab to Oberlin's throat. <laughs> Oberlin suddenly remembered something crucial. The sub rifle! I still have the sub rifle! Oberlin reached into the inside of his exposure suit and pulled it out to point the barrel directly at Whit's head. Damn it! Damn it! Oberlin's sled had little stability, causing the barrel of the submachine gun to careen wildly. Oberlin hit the rear engine mount of Witt's snowmobile. Black diesel smoke filled Oberlin's face. Witt used Oberlin's defenselessness to grab the barrel and snatch the firearm out of his hand. You're such a fool, Oberlin. We're the only chance you have. Witt swung the firearm at Oberlin's face, missing by mere inches. As he struggled to keep his hand on the throttle, Witt realized he had to end the fight now. Goodbye, Oberlin. This is for the Idrisil. Witt jammed the assault rifle into the spinning treads of Oberlin's snowmobile. The ski doo catapulted Oberlin into the air. He landed on his injured arm and desperately searched for breath. Whit brought his sled to a stop 20 yards ahead, then walked slowly towards Oberlin and stepped on his exposed hand. <laughs> you don't know what's coming. If I liked you, I'd kill you now. Do you hear that? Our time has come. Yours is already over. And with that, Whit Roberts walked away and remounted his snowmobile. Approximately one mile away, in a patch of deep snow cover toward the center of the narrow valley, a slight but growing tremor could be felt. Cracks in the underlying ice echoed off the looming mountains, and sudden pools of steaming liquid started to form along the tundra. Until suddenly, a long, straight chasm stretched across the ground. Snow and ice tumbled inward, and a blast of scalding steam erupted from the newly revealed chamber underneath the surface of the island. Out of the chasm extended a mammoth launch array, containing what looked very similar to an intercontinental ballistic missile, but significantly larger. Steam continued to pour out of the opening as the launch array spun 30 degrees north and then pointed at the horizon. Ten minutes later, Oberlin used the last of his strength to sit up. His right hand ached from the bitter cold. His eyes watered even further as he watched a gleaming silver object race upwards to the sky, leaving a long contrail of yellow fire behind it as his blood and tears froze along his face. Back in the crossbow station. Oberlin! Come back, Oberlin! Anton, we have to go after him! McCallan, you heard what they were saying. They're going to launch the arrow. We have to find Sterling and stop him. Oberlin will take care of Whit Roberts. But if Oberlin... McCallan, the mission! You're right, you're right. Okay. Which way? The passage leads left. Come on. Anton and McCallan raced down the wide corridor to the central chamber of the station. There, two sets of metal stairs led upwards to the control tower. Whit, come in, Whit. Do you copy? He's up the stairs. It must be the command tower. Okay. You take left and I'll... McCallan. McCallan, what is it? The aliens. They're here. Of course they are. They're probably with Sterling up... No. No, they're not up there. They're below us. I can sense them. Then let's go down together. No, we can't. There's no time. You need to take Sterling out. Why? I'm not strong enough and you're better at hand-to-hand. -hand. The aliens and I are connected. That means I have a better chance of stopping them. Looks like we all have scores to settle. Be careful. Without warning, Anton wrapped his arms around McCallan and pushed his face into her neck. 
She closed her eyes and could smell his hair as she squeezed him tighter. She let her hands wander to his rough face before pushing her mouth against his. Get him, Anton. Hunt well, McKellen. McAllen turned to face several flights of steps that had been carved into the frozen ground, leading downwards beyond her line of sight. The most protected part of the station. As McAllen walked down the chiseled stairwell, she noticed the light beginning to change. There were no longer any fluorescent or LCD bulbs built into the wall. Instead, a shimmering blue light clung to the rough-hewn walls, getting stronger as she descended lower. Calm. These voices heard them before. We want to see you and me. They're calling me. They must huh? come to me. McAllen reached the lowest level, where the stairs ended in a cold, bare room with a Neptunian blue glow. Within it, a three foot high reinforced metallic altar, upon which sat a glowing oval crystal. And then, on each side of the crystal stood an elderly couple. They stared at McCallum with tired eyes as their hands rested on the blue crystal. We are not your enemies. We are your friends. You. I've seen you before. Both of you. We've been waiting for you, McCallum. Waiting for me? You will free us, McCallum. You will allow us to complete our mission. Our very important mission. Mission? McAllen felt her limbs hang heavy on her body. The room itself seemed to be getting warmer, and McAllen's mind soon grew clouded. She turned her head and saw that the entrance to the staircase she had descended was no longer there. You are welcome here. What? No. Where am I? We are your family. This doesn't make sense. I need to lay down for a second. And I need to check. Is Anton all right? Where's Oberlin? I have to... Close your eyes, McAllen. McAllen's legs felt glued to the floor, and it soon became difficult to discern if the room was growing or if McAllen herself was shrinking. No, no, this isn't right. All right, McAllen. Everything going to be all right. You saved everyone, McAllen. We thank you. We all thank you. What? How? The rifle slipped from McAllen's hand and fell to the floor. Your sleep will bring the peace you've been searching no. for. The elder woman approached McAllen slowly. Her walk was awkward, and the woman's neck twitched slightly with each cautious step. The man stayed behind, continuing to lay hands on the blue crystal. It's time now, McAllen. It's time to let go. Stay away from me. You carried enough, McAllen. No, 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 no. This is the end of your time. Time. The end, McAllen. Lie down! No, 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 no! No, no, no! Anton kicked open the locked door to find Jason Sterling reaching for the control panel. Don't do it! Move your fucking hand away from the console, Sterling! Sterling stood over six feet, with his pupils now indistinguishable from the scarlet hue that filled his eyes. His skin seemed blistered and scaly as he stood completely naked. Small streams of black liquid seemed to ooze from cracks in his skin. What are you scared of, Anton? Your body has already been modified. Are you afraid of a little more change? I'm sure as hell not afraid of you, Sterling. Anton squeezed the trigger and held it. Bullets struck Sterling's chest, neck, and arms, causing hard bits of callous skin to flake off his diseased body. The giant glass expanse behind Sterling shattered from the barrage of bullets, allowing the freezing polar wind to sweep into the room. To Anton's utter shock, Sterling was unaffected by any of the bullets he absorbed. That's good, Anton. 
Because I'm not what you should be afraid of. Without breaking eye contact, Sterling slammed his hand down on the console, <laughs> activating the launch sequence of the arrow. No! Goddess, no! Behind Sterling, Anton could see the vast frozen expanse of Devon Island. At the edge of the horizon, a long silver object streaked upwards, leaving a magnificent plume of fire behind it. All of the air in Anton's lungs left his body as the realization that they were too late washed over him. They had failed. Looks like you brought the wrong gun for the wrong fight. You know, Anton, there's no reason to wait for the arrow to release the satellite beacon. I think I'm just gonna start modifying you myself. In a blurred red streak, Sterling launched himself at Anton. His fist connected like a block of stone against Anton's face, knocking out two of his teeth. The assault rifle dropped from Anton's limp hand. As he staggered backwards, Anton raised his fist and launched a punch into Sterling's face, missing by several inches. Sterling, I... I really expected more out of you, Anton. Sension isn't here to save you anymore, Anton. Looks like you don't fare too well on your own. Sterling grabbed Anton by the neck and lifted him two feet off the ground. His fingers squeezed in Anton's jugular vein. Just too weak, I guess. Sterling heaved Anton across the room in anger. Anton hit the wall hard and slumped to the floor. Sterling quickly ran to close the distance as Anton tried to weakly raise his hand for protection. Since neither of us is human anymore, I really can't see why you... Take it so seriously! You'll never win. You can't beat them. You'll just doom us all. Huh? Jason Sterling froze. His preternatural eyes seemed focused on a point far away in the distance. The Seraxians, they're in danger. Anton took advantage of this sudden lapse in concentration to push the behemoth uh. off of him. He rose to his feet, but found no sense of equilibrium available to him, and quickly stumbled to his knees in the furthest corner of the room. Sterling snapped out of the trance he was in, and urgently turned to face his enemy. It seems your McCallan still hasn't learned her lessons, but I'm gonna teach her one, right after I teach you yours, your last. Time to fix what's wrong with you. Get closer. I'll start with that beating heart of you. Just a little. Sterling stood over Anton and raised his fist upwards. With one quick movement, Anton reached inside his vest and removed his trusted dart gun. He pointed the barrel at Sterling's face and allowed his finger to spasm continuously on the trigger. Five titanium needle tip darts landed in Sterling's cheek, neck, and right eye. It will take a lot more than needles in my eye to save you. I just ensure the survival of the human race for the next 10,000 years. Too bad you're not gonna last another 10 seconds. Anton pulled a handheld detonator out of his other vest pocket and held it high over his head. This is for Othello, you mutated son of a bitch. Huh? The four embedded needles detonated their hydrocesium charges, setting Jason Sterling's entire face ablaze before the fuses exploded hundreds of microscopic shells throughout his cranium. Jason Sterling took one step towards Anton before his irradiated body fell forward, and the charred remains of his skull chipped off along the floor. Anton let his head fall back against the wall. Taking a deep exhale, he could barely see out of his left eye, while his right was completely shut. He pushed the burnt stump of Sterling's body with his boot, and then he remembered. The arrow! The room spun around him as he careened left and right, walking painfully towards the control console. He scanned the unfamiliar buttons and switches in vain to find some way to deactivate the launch of the arrow as it rose towards the upper reaches of the atmosphere. Oh, no, no, no! Oh, no, no, no! McAllen exploded her fist into the elder woman's face. The entire room flashed a brilliant white light, and for a split second, the senior couple disappeared. In their place stood two sapphire-skinned humanoids, over seven feet tall with mouthless faces and orange eyes. McCallum blinked and now saw the female lying on the ground, moving weakly while the man beside the Starstone seemed to grip the blue crystal tighter. The woman began to weakly rise to her feet, but McCallan raced to drive her foot hard into the woman's chest. No, I'm not letting you win. You go back to your hellhole of a planet, I'll kill you both before I... 
We've killed stronger than you, McAllen. Both aliens stood still and fell in and out of the human illusions they manifested. The beacon, the beacon has been launched. No, no, that can't be. No! The inside of McAllen's body went ice cold and a crippling sense of nausea overtook her. The Seraxian fleet will receive Earth's location. And the soldier ships will soon arrive. This war will be won, and we will rebuild our homeland. As the aliens communicated telepathically, McAllen seized her opportunity to grab her assault rifle. But before her hands could reach the floor, McAllen's skull suddenly exploded in pain once again as her body convulsed, throwing her violently backwards and smashing her head into the stone wall. You're too late. You, McAllen, will die for nothing. McAllen's eyes couldn't focus. Her strength was fading. Through each blink, her enemies cycled between appearing as the eerie elderly couple and the menacing Seraxian life forms. You are like the witch. You are stopping us from our mission. Trillions of lives depend on us. Your life, your insignificant life, cannot impede us. We celebrate your death. Alan. Celebrate this, motherfuckers. Holy! Tully stood in the entrance to the staircase that was now visible again to McAllen. Under his right shoulder was a broken piece of fuselage, serving as a crutch to support his weight. The rifle in his hand was smoking, having just released 20 rounds of hollow tip bullets into Elgar. The sudden death of her partner for the last 10,000 years shocked Karana. Your mission is over, you alien bitch. We will exterminate all of you. And with speed too quick to register, Karana took her right hand, plated with sharp enamel claws, to McAllen's throat and squeezed determinedly. McAllen could feel Karana invading her mind to freeze her limbs. McAllen! Karana held her left hand towards Tully and brought her orange gaze upon him. His body stiffened as he fell to the ground roughly. It's over, McAllen. Karana's face was just inches away, and McAllen could see the pebbled texture of the blue Seraxian skin as her vision began to narrow. The aliens are insidious, and they can get inside of you. You never really stood a chance. Evangeline, you have my strength, McAllen. No one will ever be able to take that away from you. McAllen felt the fingers in her left hand twitch, with her one free hand, McAllen reached to her neck and yanked on the wolf pendant that Evangeline had given her. She plunged the tiny poison blade into Karana's abdomen. McAllen strained to take in air as Karana's grip was released and could now see the wound bubbling and fizzing on her Seraxian skin. McAllen reached her hand high above her head and plunged the blade into the back of the Seraxian's neck. The alien's orange eyes grew cloudy before Karana slumped lifelessly to the floor. You're the worst of us. It's you that never stood a chance. Ah, uh, ow. Uh, McAllen. McAllen, are you okay? Tully. Your face. Are you? I'm, I'm okay. Are you? I'm, I'm okay. Can you walk? No, but other than that, I'm okay. Jesus, you're crazy. Here, here, let me help you up. I got you. Ow! Um, ah. Lean on me. We gotta get out of here. Come on. I'll help you with the steps. We gotta hurry. I saw Anton at the top. Sterling hurt him pretty bad. McAllen helped Tully up the stone steps to the central you. chamber of the crossbow station, there we go. where Anton was slumped on the floor with his back against the wall. His blood covered one side of his face, and his nose was clearly broken. Anton! The, the arrow, he... They fired. I know, I know, Anton. They launched the arrow, but we gotta get you out of here. Can you stand? Anton, can you stand? Yeah, I think I... Come on. Up, up, up. Come on. McCallum got down on her knees to hook her neck under Anton's shoulder. You can do she it. She lifted up, bearing oh. most of his weight. You, Together, they leaned on each other, right 
as they stumbled back towards the wreckage of the condor. McCallan concentrated on the placement of each footstep, knowing she was supporting both Anton and Come Tully. On, Come on, they guys. moved deliberately but slowly, with McCallan between the two men. We gotta get to the transponder. Hey, where's Oberlin? He went after Whit Roberts. We gotta find him. Give me the binoculars. Here, Anton. Lead against the side here. Too cold. Oh, I think I see him. Anton's lost a lot of blood. Keep him awake, no matter what. Gonna lose the light soon. Where's our extraction? Where's our place? Scan the skies. We have to find Henderson. We... Hey. Guys, look. Above us. In the distance, Anton Tully and McCallan watched the alien missile known as the Arrow flare brightly in the high polar sky, streaking towards the upper reaches of the atmosphere, where it would soon deploy its satellite cargo and summon the Seraxian fleet to the planet Earth. Guys, we lost. We... We lost. You have been listening to Season 3 of The Leviathan Chronicles. To listen to all of the Season 3 episodes right now and get the exclusive epilogue episode, purchase the Season 3 Director's Cut at leviathanchronicles.com or click the link in the show notes for immediate download. The Leviathan Chronicles was written and created by Christoph Lepupka, executive produced by Robin Shaw, produced and musical composition by Luke Allen, directed by Nobi Nakanishi. For more information and news, visit our website or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for supporting us and thank you for listening. Hi, this is Christoph Laputka, and I want to thank you for listening to Season 3 of the Leviathan Chronicles. I hope you've been enjoying our most action-packed season yet, because we want to keep growing the Leviathan universe with spin-off stories and future seasons. But we need your help. That's why I'm asking you to check out our first-ever Kickstarter campaign by going to leviathanchronicles.com slash kickstarter, or just clicking on the link in our show notes. There, we have many levels of support, as well as some really amazing rewards. One of our favorite characters is Salty Squid Bartender, Angus McKay. He really appreciates your support, and one of the rewards we're offering is a limited edition recipe book for Angus's favorite Leviathan cocktails that we found in an old corner of the squid. You can find cool items like that and much more on Kickstarter by going to leviathanchronicles.com slash kickstarter. We can't wait to get started on creating more audio dramas like Leviathan. Your help really does ensure that future projects will have the resources they need to make it from our headphones to yours. Thank you again for listening listening to season three and thank you for checking out our Kickstarter campaign. I'll see you guys real soon. Leviathan Audio Production. Chauncey Haworth, Mark Slade, and Lothar Tuppen. The demented minds behind the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour bring you... Twisted, Twisted Pulp Magazine. Magazine. A journey beyond surreality, to worlds you never knew or hoped existed. Worlds of the supernatural, worlds of dark satire, worlds of nightmarish futures. Twisted Pulp Magazine. If you thought the 21st century was weird enough already, think again. Twisted Pulp Magazine. A step beyond your grandfather's pulp. Available at digitalvaudeville.com. That's D I G I T A L V A U D E V I L L E dot com. Mm-hmm.